Here we go. So thank you all for coming. Welcome. We're back in our study on salvation of all. Um, just to kind of briefly recap, we've been talking about how from starting in Genesis all the way through the book of Revelation, God's plan is to bring salvation to everyone, each in their own order, including um, Satan and his angels. And I know that if this is the first time you've been hearing this, it's, it's, a, it's a shocking revelation. It's kind of hard to understand, hard to believe. But as we continue to go through the scriptures, line by line, hopefully this will become more and more fan of manifest, what God is doing, why he's doing it, and how he's doing it. So we're going to pick up today in salvation of all in the New Testament. We spent the last couple of sessions talking about the types and the shadows and the symbols and, and everything in the Old Testament in the law that um, God had hidden since the beginning of the world, the, uh, the mystery hidden that Paul talks about. And now in the New Testament, it's revealed. So now we're going to cover um, what's revealed in the New Testament. So I've already dealt with the most problematic passages in my other study, which is called Hell is Not Endless Punishment. So you can go back through that study, and I take all those verses that just sound like eternal hellfire, eternal judgment, smoke of torment rising up for and ever and ever, weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth, all of those terrible phrases. I deal with those in detail and show you what they really mean and how they really are about salvation and not just eternal torment. So what we're going to focus on today is the verses that proclaim the true gospel. So I encourage you to go back, listen to the hell is not endless punishment, get those verses out of your mind, and then we can focus on what the real um, revelation of the mystery is, and you can really appreciate what this is really saying. So we're going to start with the Gospels. This is Matthew 18, 11 to 14. For the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. How think ye if a man have a hundred sheep, and one of them be gone astray, he does not leave the ninety and nine, and goes after into the mountains, and seeks that which has gone astray. And if it so be that he find it, verily I say to you, he rejoices more of that sheep than of the ninety and nine which went not astray. Even so is it it is not the will of your father which is in heaven. Even so, it is not the will of your Father in heaven that any one of these little ones should perish. Through this parable, the heart of our Heavenly Father is clearly revealed. He cares about every one of his sheep and will not let any perish. In Matthew, Christ instructs Peter to endlessly forgive his brother who sins against him. If this is Christ's doctrine, then he must forgive us for our transgressions against him and in his Father as well. This is Matthew 18, 21 and 22. Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me? I forgive him till seven times. Jesus said unto him, I say not unto thee unto seven times, but unto 70 times seven. Now, when you get into the, um, the symbols of scripture, you'll come to see that the number seven is about completion. So he's not just saying literally it's 70 times seven. He's saying, you know, it's endlessly. You forgive your brother, brother to no end. In Luke, the, the good news of the gospel is for all people. This is Luke 2.10. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. And you'll notice this pattern of, of this inclusive language. And we saw this in the Psalms, too, that so many times it talks about how this applies to everyone. As Christ was hanging on the cross, he asked his father to forgive those who were crucifying him. If they are forgiven for crucifying the Son of God, then who cannot be forgiven? Luke 23, 34. Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment or his clothes, and they cast lots to see who was going to, to get them. The next verse is self-explanatory, John 1, 29. The next day, John sees... Jesus coming unto him and says, Behold, the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. Why was Christ sent into the world? This is John 3, 17. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Now, many people read this word might and conclude that it's only a possibility that Christ could save the world you know, if you were to accept his free offer. 
when in reality it's a declaration of Christ's mission that he will save the whole world. Young's literal translation makes this much more clear. This is the same verse, John 3.17 in Young's literal. It says, For God did not send his, his Son into the world that he may judge the world, but that the world may be saved through him. So he's, he's contrasting. He did not come to judge the world. He did not come to condemn the world. He came to save the world. It's not an if. Christ will accomplish the will of the Father, but what is the will of the Father? 1 Timothy 2, 3, and 4. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. In John 6, 37 to 39. And that the Father gives me shall come to all that the Father gives me shall come to me. And to him that comes to me, I will in no wise cast out. For I came down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will which has sent me, that all which he has given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again on the last day. Okay, so now the question is who is the Father going to give to him? Is it only a certain number of people? And he answers it in John 12, 31 and 32. It says, Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. So from the sum of the word, it's quite clear that this message of salvation is inclusive and God is going to accomplish what we saw in Isaiah, I believe it was 53, that what the Lord desires, he does. He does all of his pleasure. If he wills something, his arm is not too short that he can't do it. So many people will say, well, God desires all men to be saved, but because of your free will, he can't make you choose him. And that's just a um, improper view of God's will. What God wills, he does. It's not of man that wills or runs, but God that shows mercy. <clears throat> and there's other, other studies on the site um, called After the Council of His Own Will that makes it quite clear that God wants you, he gets you, and he wants everybody. It's just an order in which it happens. Here in Acts, uh, Peter explains God's plan of salvation, um, to his, God's plan to save all, as witnessed by the prophets long ago. This is Acts 3, 19 to 25. It says, Repent therefore and turn again, that your sins may be blotted out, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send the Christ appointed for you, Jesus, whom heaven must receive until the time for restoring all the things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets long ago. Moses said, The Lord God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brothers. You shall listen to him in whatever he tells you, and it shall be that every soul who does not listen to that prophet shall be destroyed from the people. And all the prophets who have spoken from Samuel to those who came after him also proclaimed these days, You are the sons of the prophets and of the covenant that God made with your father, saying to Abraham, And in your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. So just to sum that up, verse 21 is the key. It says, whom heaven must receive until the time for restoring all the things about which God spoke. It's, this is other translations call it the restoration of all things. And that's what God is going to do. He is reconciling the world to himself in an order in due time. Christ the first fruits, after those that are Christ at coming, then comes the end. So there's a process to the harvest, but everything gets harvested. So now let's go to Paul's writings. Um, I'm going to quote a number of passages from the book of Romans to show how Paul taught the salvation of all. This is Romans 5, 6 to 8. For when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commends his love towards us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And skip down to verse 17. For if by one man's offense, death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of this gift of righteousness shall they reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. And this is referring back to, you know, Adam, who was the first to transgress the law. Now, most 
people have been taught that Adam was created perfect and then fell. But that's that's not the truth of the scriptures. The truth of the scriptures is he was made marred in the hands of the potter. And the the fruit that was given, the forbidden fruit he shouldn't eat, was just the first law that manifests the fact that Adam was marred sinful flesh and wasn't created perfect. So what Paul is saying is, as through Adam, the first sin was made manifest, so through, and then in turn, it manifests for all of mankind after him. In the same way, Christ is going to bring righteousness to all. So um, you can see the comparison, how it, it's, it's an all-inclusive. Nobody would say that, you know, the curse of sin starting back with Adam was only for certain people. It's inclusive. So you can see the comparison drawing to salvation of all. This is verse 18 to 21. Therefore, as by the offense of one judgment came upon all to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That as sin has reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Christ Jesus our Lord. So Paul draws the comparison between Adam bringing death to all, so Christ brings righteousness to all. If all have sinned, then all shall be saved. To further emphasize this point, it is shown that grace abounds more than sin. Those verses in Romans 8 clearly reveal that God is the one who subjected uh, these verses in Romans 8 clearly reveal that God is the one who subjected the creation to vanity and will deliver us from bondage in due time. This is Romans 8, 19 to 21. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity not willingly, but by reason of him who has subjected the same in hope, because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption to the glorious liberty of the children of God. So if you just think through that passage, what he's saying, it wasn't Adam's free will or anyone's free will that they chose to transgress the law and therefore are made sinful and under this curse. No, God made everyone subject to vanity because he made us with sinful flesh and he didn't give us his spirit from the beginning. And then through this process, he's going to set us free from this bondage into the liberty of the children of God by adopting us and changing us. In Romans 11, Paul explains the mystery of how the temporary blindness of Israel is actually used to save the Gentiles, and then both will be saved. So you've got to know first that really just all that Gentile means is not Jewish. If you weren't Jewish, you were Gentile. There was only two categories. So this includes every person on the entire face of the earth. You were either a Jew or a Gentile. This is the Romans 11, 25 to 32. For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And so all Israel shall be saved, as it is written, there shall come out of Zion a deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them, that I will take away their sins. As concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes, but as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sakes. For the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. For as you in times past have not believed God, you have now obtained mercy through their unbelief. Even so have these also now not believed that through your mercy they may also obtain mercy. For God has concluded them all in unbelief that he may have mercy upon all. So Paul is explaining the reason why some people don't receive the truth at first and others do later. He's specifically talking to, you know, the Romans. So he's talking to a, a Gentile group that is realizing that many of the, of the Jews rejected Christ and the message initially. And he's saying the reason that they're rejecting this is for your benefit, that you can be grafted in, that you can be heirs to the promise. But then later, you're going there. The Gentiles are going to be the one to bring the Jews in. So again, it's just another way through the types and shadows of Jews and Gentiles that all are being brought into God's family. We'll end our quotes from Romans with this statement, Romans 14, 11. For it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess 
to God. Romans 10, 9 also says, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Well, here we have everybody kneeling and confessing to God. So just right there, putting those two verses together, you can see everyone is eventually going to um, see God's glory and worship it and, and thus be saved. I mean, to be saved is really just to be made like Christ. That's all it really means. It's not something you do in a 10-second sinner's prayer just by believing one fact. It's a process by which all of the old man is burned out and the new man is created. We've already gone over some of these verses in 1 Corinthians, but they're worth certainly reading again and again. This is 1 Corinthians 15, 23. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward they are to Christ coming. And then comes the end. We're at 1 Corinthians 15, 26. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Well, if death is destroyed, how can anybody be in hell? Can't be. There's no death. 1 Corinthians 15, 28. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. So many people will say that the definition of hell is separation from God. Well, if your knee is bowing, your tongue is confessing, and you're subdued unto him, you're in his presence. There is no separation from God. 1 Corinthians 15, 51. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Verse 54. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So the whole point is that death, the grave, all of it is eventually destroyed. Like it says in Revelation, all the tears are wiped away. Well, if you have a, you know, huge mass of millions or billions of people burning for all eternity, where is the victory in that? There is no victory. There's a huge failure. And that's not what the scriptures reveal. Paul says in 2 Corinthians that God is reconciling the world unto himself through Christ and does not impute their trespasses to them. 2 Corinthians 5, 18 and 19. And all things are of God who has reconciled to us himself by Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation to wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself not imputing their trespasses unto them, and has committed unto us the word of reconciliation. The book of Ephesians says that God is going to gather together into one all things in Christ. This is Ephesians 1, 7 to 10. In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, wherein he has abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which on earth, even in him. So again, notice the inclusive language, this all men, all things. It's not some, it's just each in their own order. The fullness of God's Spirit is going to be in every one of his children. This is a second witness to what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, that God will be all in all. This is Ephesians 1, 20 to 23. Which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. For above all principality and power and might and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come, and has put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church which is his body, the fullness of him that fills all in all. All that's saying is that the fullness of God's spirit is going to be in all of his creation. Ephesians 4.10 He that descended in, is the same that also ascended far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. Here is God's end goal, which is to have every when bow to Christ. Philippians 2, 9 to 11. Wherefore God also has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, 
that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in the earth and things under the earth that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So Christ's mission is to reconcile all things to the Father, and then once that happens, as 1 Corinthians 15 explains, the kingdom is given back to the Father, because God is the one who's going to be the ruler of his kingdom. Christ just has a, um, a role now to reconcile all things. Just the same way how Joseph was given power in the throne to rule Egypt, but Pharaoh was still the ruler of Egypt. It was a temporary rulership to accomplish something very specific, and then he returns the rule to him. This does not mean that they should bow as if it is a suggestion or um, a command that is not followed, but rather is a statement of what will actually happen. This is Romans 14, 11, and 12. For as it is written, and as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. So it's stating what is going to happen, not, well, you may or you may not. All things are subdued unto Christ, and shall be made like him. This is Philippians 3, 20 to 21. For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ who shall change in our vile body that it may be fashioned into his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. And I know this is sounding repetitive, and it's intended to be repetitive, because I'm trying to show you just exhaustively how many times this is said, just over and over and over. Christ will reconcile all things unto himself, including his enemies. We're commanded to love our enemies, so why would God do any less and he commands us to do. Is he going to command us to love our enemies and to burn his in hell forever? Seems pretty hypocritical. Colossians 1, 19 to 22. For it is pleased, for it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell, and having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself by him. I say, there, I say whether they be things in earth or things in heaven, and you, that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unprovable in his sight. Matthew 5, 43, you've heard it was said, that you shall love your enemy and you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies and bless them that cursed you and do good to them that hate you and pray for them which despitefully use and persecute you. So how would God do good to his enemies if he burns them forever? That doesn't make any sense. And that was what I started realizing was that what I'd been taught all these years in the church was so inconsistent with the commands God gives to his people and with his character. That you may be the children of your father which is in heaven, for he makes the sun to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. For if you love them which love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the publicans do the same? So if God only loves his children who are obedient to him and love him, he's just as evil as these publicans or sinners that he's talking about. And if you salute only your brethren, what do you more than others? Do not even the publicans do so? But ye therefore be perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. So you say he's using God as the standard to tell us how to love our enemies. If, if he was telling us to go out and kill our enemies and hate them and never forgive them, then he would say that here. But he's not. He's saying the opposite. He's saying, love your enemies. If God is a hypocrite, is God a hypocrite, or will he treat his enemies with love and forgiveness um, and forgive his own rebellious children? Now, you've got to go through the hell study and the Milk Doctrine series on eternal judgment to realize that this, etern this salvation of all is not the same as the salvation of all taught in most churches that are universal salvation, universal reconciliation churches. They teach it's a grace unto lasciviousness. We'll just, there's many paths to God. Do whatever you want to do. God's just going to give everybody a, a get-out-of-jail-free card. But that's not what God's salvation is through fire. There is going to be judgment. Everyone's going to be made like Christ. There's just an order in which it happens. So we all are going to reap what we sow. There's no getting around that. Everyone has to live by every word in the scriptures. So please don't misunderstand that I'm saying do whatever you want in your life and you're going to be saved. Now you will be forced at some point to be obedient to all of this. So why did Christ come into the world? 
1 Timothy 1.15. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. Who does God desire to be saved? 1 Timothy 2.3-6. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator, mediator between God and men, the man Jesus Christ, who gave himself a ransom for all, for some, no, for all, to be testified in due time. Who did Christ come to save? 1 Timothy 4, 9-11. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. Therefore, we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God who is the Savior of all men, especially those that believe. And when he says especially those that believe, he's talking about now because there's an order in which the salvation happens. So in this age, in this physical life, only some are the elect who are saved. They are the especially. But then comes the end. And there is a second resurrection, and there is a second time of judgment in the lake of fire where everyone else goes through that same process. And that's what's not understood. And then verse 11, these things command and teach. Teach what? That God is the Savior of all men, especially those that believe. God can do what, can, can God do what he desires to do, or is he limited in some way? This is Isaiah 46.10. Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done. Now, that's a really important phrase. Declaring the end from the beginning. What does that mean? God's written the book. It's like when an author is writing a book, he can tell you the end from the beginning because he's not in the story. He's outside of it. He's above the story. He's creating the characters. He can go back and do whatever he wants. And God's the same way. He's written the book for everyone's life. And he can tell you what's going to happen in the end before it's yet to be revealed to us. And then the end of the verse says, My counsel shall stand. I will do all my pleasure. It's God's pleasure to write, All men are going to be saved. Therefore, he's going to do it. Nothing can stop him from doing that. To whom has God's grace appeared? Second Titus 2.11 For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. And the next verse says, chastening us, teaching us. It means to, to chasten, to scourge, to teach people to forsake ungodliness and live righteous lives in this present age. So that's that grace that God gives is not just this free gift of unmerited favor to where you just get a pardon for all the things you do wrong. His gift is to teach you to forsake them. So it's still a gift in the sense that he's going to do it through you, but you still have to go through it. You don't just, you know, get your Jesus card and just walk into the presence of God. You have to go through all of the steps. So we're going to, uh, I've only got three pages left, so I'm going to finish this here. Um, so let's look at the other New Testament writings. This is Hebrews. For whom did Christ taste death? Hebrews 2, 8 to 11. That was put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. But now we see not yet all things put under him. So catch what that's saying. He's just exhaustively saying that all things are going to be put under Christ's feet, that he's going to have dominion and, and rule over it all. But it's not yet happened. He says, but now we see not yet all things put under him. That's that order of salvation. Not everyone is yet obedient to Christ. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. For it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For both he that sacrifices and those who are sanctified are all of one, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. So Christ is the first of the first fruits. He goes first. He died on the cross. He lived the perfect sinless life. He's gone to set the pattern. And then he comes back within his elect to bring the Spirit of God to, walk, to work out that same salvation. So Christ is giving us the salvation, but it's not this instant imputation of righteousness that the churches teach. It's a process by salvation. 
and there's a study on my site, um, trinaspirits.com, called The Mystery of the Kingdom of God that goes through and explains in, in great detail how this salvation works and what it means in Colossians 1, 24 and 25 that Paul says, I fill up what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ for his body's sake, which is the church. So that's more the mechanics of how the salvation works, now that we know what's going to happen. Is Christ going to destroy the power of death and redeem Satan as well? Hebrews 2.14. For so much as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that has the power of death, that is, the devil. So here's an article that Mike wrote called, Will Satan and His Angels Be Saved?, and you'll actually come to see that Satan being destroyed is the same thing as our old man being destroyed. It's the same thing as the beast and the false prophet being destroyed. You're actually saved through your own destruction. And Satan and his angels are in the exact same boat. They were created by God for a purpose to be used to be a part of revealing God's glory. And then in the end, he'll be reconciled just like everyone else. So who does the Lord desire to perish and who will come to repentance? Because, you know, most of us have heard, well, you know, God desires you to be saved. Not everyone's going to be saved. So, you know, who's left in? Who's, who's left out? Who's brought in? Second Peter 3, 8, 9. But, beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, saying he's not slow, he's not delaying. As some men count slackness or slowness, but he is long-suffering to us. He's patient towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And again, you're going to be told, well, yeah, God desires all to be saved, but if you don't choose him. No, that's nonsense. God does all he desires. We read that in Isaiah 46. God says he wants to do it. He does it. There's no limits on what he can do. For whom is Christ the propitiation? Did he only die for the sins of those who obey him now in this life? 1 John 2, 2. And he is the propitiation for our sins, and not only for ours, but also the sins of the whole world. So right there, it just shows you this is an all-inclusive salvation. And propitiation, you can just look at it as um, you know, the, the one that cleanses us from those sins. He's the one that's going to come through and take those sins away. For whom is Christ the Savior? This is um, John 14, 4, 14. And have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. What is Christ going to do to the works of the devil and the devil himself? This is 1 John 3, 8. He that commits sin is of the devil, for the devil sins from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Notice here, too, it says that he sinned from the beginning. Satan wasn't created a perfect angel who fell. All that stuff, is you've heard, is not true. He wasn't an angel who fell. He was created a crooked serpent. The Lord formed the crooked serpent. He made the waster to destroy. And he used him for a purpose. And he's going to destroy his works and the devil himself and make him new, like everyone else. 1 Corinthians 3.15 if any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. And that, as I've been talking about in this whole series and the hell series, fire is purification. It, it, it does destroy, but it destroys the wood, hay, and stubble, and it purifies the gold. So, if any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, as yet by fire. It's a real, that's a verse... We should all memorize 1 Corinthians 3.15. We'll conclude with these two passages in the book of Revelation. Revelations 15, 3 to 4. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou art holy, for all nations shall come and worship before thee. For thy judgments are made manifest. If people are in hell, separated from God, how can they come and worship before thee? They can't. And that's why that's a false doctrine. All of them are going to come worship. Revelations 21, 4 and 5. 
And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and beautiful. Now the revelation that all are going to be saved is a milk doctrine. I know if this is new to you, this is probably pretty shocking and sounds like it sounds like meat if you've been drinking the poison for years of the doctrines of the world and the church. But this is just a beginning, a foundational principle of the doctrine of Christ. And it's it's good. You should desire this sincere milk to grow thereby. Study this, learn it, be excited about it. That's great. But I just want you to know that this is the beginning. And there's much, much more to come after this. So I encourage you to read the six milk doctrines as it will form your foundation for a future understanding of the word. And then you will go on into the judgment of the Lord, which will form you like Christ. And you will learn that through patience possess you your soul. And it's going to be a lifetime process coming, growing into that. So if you're able to contact me, I'll put my email address here. Um, there's contact info on the websites on tryingthespirits.com and iswasandwillbe.com. You know, we're all here to be a helper of your joy. So I hope that this study and all the others do that very thing. So that's the end of the study. All y'all are welcome to make any comments, ask any questions, whatever y'all like. I got a word. But that word, I don't know what that word is. Propitiation? Yeah. It just, it like means he's the sacrifice for our sins. It's basically what he's saying. Christ is the one that's going to take our sins away. And the way he does it is just as he died on the cross, so we are crucified with him. Like Paul says, I'm crucified with Christ. And that crucifixion is every day dying to the old man. So Christ is being your propitiation because he's dwelling within you and changing you. He is causing you to overcome your sin. That's how he's the propitiation for your sins. Does that make sense? <laughs> Steve, go ahead, Steve. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. I'd just like to make a few comments, uh, Mitch. And uh, you know, as other witnesses of scriptures and stuff, uh, you know, some of the scriptures uh, that you were quoting and every, I, I was as you were doing your talk, I was thinking some of these scriptures. And of course, you you brought some of the scriptures up, like in Hebrews uh, two fourteen. But anyway. Uh, I'd like to say one thing, Mitch. In the beginning of your, your study here, you used the one scripture where Christ says, you know, that he came to save that which is lost. Uh -huh. And the word translated lost is apollome, and apollome is also translated as destroy. So really? Yes. <clears throat> and Interesting. that was one, and then, uh, you know, this uh, so scriptures here, Mitch, is uh, another witness to the, you know, the, of uh, you know, the universal, you know, that Christ is going to save everybody. And this is in John 4, 440 to 442. And it says, uh, so when the Samaritans were come unto him, they besought him that he would tarry with them, and he abode there two days. And many more believed because of his own word. And said unto the woman, now we believe, not because of thy saying, for we have heard him ourselves, and know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. Amen to that. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you, 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 uh, and again in your talk you mentioned about, you know, the book. I just want to, you know, uh, read a couple of scriptures, you know, about the book. And one of them is, is Exodus uh, 32, uh, 32. We, I mean, this is with Moses, and it says, Yet now, if you will forgive their sin, and if not, he says, Blot me, I pray thee, out of thy book, which you has written. Another witness to the book is in Revelation, there's a, or a few of them. This is from Revelation 3 5. And he that overcomes the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father. And before his angels. 
Amen to that, Steve. Sort of yeah. Great confirmations. Yeah. So, so I'm just going to, you know, end it right there, Mitch. Well, appreciate it, Steve. It just says it over and over and over, doesn't it? Yep. Well, once it's kind of like, you know, have you ever done that where you, where you get a new car and all of a sudden you start seeing that car everywhere on the road? Yep. <laughs> <Same thing. laughs> Once you realize salvation of all, every verse you read practically starts jumping out at you. Anybody else? No? All right. Well, I need to figure out... Uh, we'll be back next week. I'm going to... Um, pick a new topic. Uh, I'm not quite sure what I'm going to do yet. I think I made through, I, I did a study a while back on um, ages of ages and I never got it recorded because it was in London and didn't come through. So I think I may do that for a couple of weeks and then we have some um, other studies after that. So, so thank you all for coming. Appreciate it. And we'll see you on Monday.